This episode is brought to you by Zillow. You've probably spent hours Zillowing on Zillow, scrolling through beach houses, looking up the Zestimate of your boss's house. But Zillow is so much more than searching for homes. Now, Zillowing means finding a top agent who's with you all the way, working with a top-rated loan officer to find a mortgage with Zillow Home Loans, and getting into the home of your dreams, whether it's on a beach or not. Zillow, let's get you home. Download the Zillow app today. Zillow Home Loans, NMLS number 10287. And gentlemen, to those who celebrate, we have reached the end of the off-season workouts. There we go. That's more specific. End of the off-season workouts. Bengals wrapped up mandatory minicamp on Thursday. Uh, We didn't talk about that yesterday because I had two special guests on uh, talking about Joe Burrow's endorsement deals and what goes into that. So if you missed that podcast, uh, tune into that wherever you get your podcasts. It's a really good chat, but... Finally, after I want to say three days, Mike, Andrew, and myself are back together. It was just me yesterday, because today's Friday, and Wednesday it was just me and Andrew after Logan Wilson's uh, celebrity softball game. So look at that. The, we've got the g- gang all here to wrap up the week. Welcome into our final unique workout off-season edition of the Strictly Stripes podcast. Like I said, Muhammad Ahmad is here with you, yours truly, with Mike Nislik and Andrew Gillis uh, to wrap up the week. Before we wrap up the week, make sure you tell us why you're a Bengals fan. Go to strictlystripes.com, click on the link that says why I'm a Bengals fan. Tell us your story. So, uh, yeah, tell us your story. Uh, This is one of the last chances you'll have to tell us your story because we're going to start telling these stories on this podcast next week. Uh, And I should add, you can also... Email your story to stripes at cleveland.com if that's easier for you. And make sure you sign up for our Strictly Stripes newsletter by going to cleveland.com slash newsletters and signing up for free. It's easy and it's in your inbox every morning through the week. So uh, make sure you do that. So I don't want to say the Bengals just stood around all week because, you know, they, they moved their feet just a little bit. They moved their arms just a little bit. But in all seriousness, um, They had one of the lighter, I want to say the lighter uh, mandatory mini camps in the league and probably one of the lightest off seasons in the league, which, you know, we've talked about that time and time again on the podcast, but that's not to say that, you know, we can't take anything away from this week, let alone, you know, what we've seen in the last two months, um, you know, between the draft wrapping up and to where we are now with five weeks left before training camp. But, you know, just for either of you guys. Uh, and I guess you can go first, Andrew, because you, you wrote about this and you've got some good thoughts on this. I mean, as you're going into end of June and July, what are your biggest takeaways from the Bengals just this offseason so far? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I think it's kind of funny and, and I think it's kind of telling that, you know, some of the bigger takeaways I had were actually guys who who didn't play in uh, in any kind of mini camp setting. Um, they were off to the side. You know, you, you look at Jonah Williams. Uh, you know, he comes back after his uh, trade request reports this week, says he expects to be cleared kind of weeks before training camp. Um, you know, he's a guy who, you know, if if he's able to kind of take that right tackle spot, you know, it's again, it's a position that not many people, you know, kind of see the, um, you know, see how difficult that could be. I mean, you know, he's still going to have to block TJ Watt when they play the Steelers. Like, you know, this is not a you know, a downgrade in terms of position, you know, this is a, um, you know, this is still a pretty big deal. So, you know, him being healthy is is a pretty big deal. Um, You know, just kind of getting him back into the mix. Um, But he sounds like he's going to be ready to go. And, you know, he sounds like he's ready for that challenge. So that that was kind of the first question that I had going into the week. Um, You know, but somebody who really impressed me and, you know, like I said, sign of the times when it's somebody who doesn't who doesn't participate in minicamp uh, was Ch- uh, Chidobi Awuzie. He, he looked really good. You know, he looked really quick. He looked really fast. He really didn't look like he was carrying a ton of pain when he was running or, you know, trying to manage any kind of pain or anything like that. You know, he, um, you know, obviously this is our untrained eye kind of watching this, but, you know, I thought he looked pretty good when he was just kind of doing some agil- agility drills in the end zone. Uh, you know, Zach Taylor said that yesterday that he thought he looked really good too, but, you know, I thought Zach had a fair point. You know, you, you've kind of learned enough in, in this business and in this industry to, I, I, you know, to not jump the gun there on injuries and kind of think that things are, you know, getting better 
Um, you know, you don't you don't want to you don't want to get uh, too far ahead of yourself. But you know, I thought Cheeto looked really good. Um, you know, and just kind of how he was uh, how he was moving. So I mean, if you can get him back in the mix, that'd be big. But yeah, I mean, I think I said you know, I mean, I think I said at the top the the two guys who who kind of gave me the biggest things to learn from this week actually didn't even participate in minicamp. So it was uh, I guess it was a pretty unique week. Very much so. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and Jonah kind of rescinding his trade request for now was sort of, I, I don't know if you mentioned that specifically, but that, you know, that he's just sort of going to move off of that and play out this year. Um, you know, the other thing for me was that a lot of these position battles, you know, won't start until training camp, essentially. I mean, you really couldn't get much of a, a look at things. I think there were two exceptions to that. I think, um, you know, uh, Brad Robbins um, clearly has, you know, more um, physical, you know, the skill set, the talent to, I think, easily win that battle. Just, you know, it, it wasn't a lot of competitive situations, but just in terms of his leg, uh, the hang time he got versus, you know, Drew Kurtzman, you could just see it. Um, and then the other one is is the backup quarterback situation. I don't think oh, yeah. the um, Bengals will have Jake Brown against their backup quarterback. That's what I'll just say. Wait, wait. Well, I mean, really? So you can you can carry three now. Um, you know, you can. I'm saying he won't be number two on the depth chart. Yeah, um, that would be that right. So I, I, I don't think I just I like Mike's right. I just I think that just as a reminder for for people listening, like you can carry because um, they just add. It's essentially like. Um, uh, the emergency backup. It's like a new rule they approved, I think. Yeah, if you fall, you can designate an emergency third quarterback. Um, you know, so I, I you know, it, it might be worth it to keep a third quarterback around. Um, you know, just in case everything. No, I didn't necessarily yeah. mean he won't make the roster. I'm just saying he will not be right. the number two quarterback on the team. That's right. right. And, and you're right, and I agree with you, and I know that's what you're saying. I just wanted to clarify that, like for anybody who's like, oh wow, they might only carry two quarter. Like they, they might, they will probably have a third quarterback around. Just because, um, just because of that new rule this year, which they pretty much passed it because of the whole Brock Purdy, Josh Johnson thing in the NFC Championship game, right? I think that's what uh, it was, or at least that's too, what it boils yeah. down to. Which God, that game was such a mess. But uh, hang on, so I, I obviously I know what you're saying, Mike. They're all going to be on the roster, but you think Browning is better than Trevor Simeon? I don't know how I feel about that. The, the I actually opposite. disagree. I, no, he's, he's, he's saying it the other way around. Him. Oh, okay. As I said, number two, like Burrow, and then Browning, number two, and then Simeon, number three. I, I didn't understand what you meant. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're all on the same page. Not, yeah, will not be the backup quarterback. Yeah, Browning, uh, with respect to him, did not look great. Um, and actually, the interesting point to that as well, to kind of maybe – this isn't a big takeaway, but something I thought about. There was one guy who picked him off. I think it was – yeah, it was Thursday, and it was DJ Ivy seventh round pick who we haven't really talked much about or heard much about because I mean, it's natural when you're that late of a pick, but uh, who knows? I mean, by no means is he going to be a starter, but does he make the 53 man roster? Does he beat out Alan George? I don't know. Or, you know, do they both make the roster? How many corners do you want to go deep for depth? Because obviously I would think based on what you guys said, Cheeto will certainly be ready for training camp and could very, very well be, ready for week one if not week one i would i mean this is just a guess no later than week two or three but you know even then say cheeto's healthy depth is depth we saw what happened to them last year all the injuries piling up in the middle of the year does dj ivy make a case does alan george make a stronger case just as strong uh i don't know and maybe does sydney jones the fourth make a case because uh the only other time Joe Burrow got picked. No, the only time he got picked, because the Ivy pick was from Browning, the only time Burrow got picked, I think, was when Sidney Jones got a tip pass from T. Higgins near the sideline and made a pretty clean pick. Uh, I know it's one interception. You can't read too much into it. But, I mean, you know, we always talk about how you got to have depth on the O-line. True. It's more important. Same goes with the uh, secondary. When I say the secondary, I especially mean that cornerback, because they got a little thin last year. Eli was banged up a little. Eli Apple. Cheeto goes down. Um, Mike Hilton went down a little bit with a finger injury, same with Jalen Davis. So when you got Dax Hill as your slot corner, then yeah, like you need depth. And so I think they'll, they'll recognize that going into, uh, you know, next season. But yeah, I think the real main takeaways you guys touched on it is, is Cheeto and, and Jonah, who ironically didn't even like actively participate in the seven on sevens or the 11 on 11s or the 
seven on nines. But yeah, I think obviously Jonah's in the driver's seat uh, for that competition battle. And we're not going to see it until, you know, training camp starts on, I believe it's July 26th. So like I said, in five weeks, but I'm just curious. I mean, even though we all agree, like Jonah is going to be in the driver's seat, like what is the percentage chance you give him of winning the job? Like, would you put it at 60, 65? And then the second question to that is like, what does Jackson Carmen have percentage wise of winning the job? 20, 15%. I mean, cause I would think with Lyle Collins, another point to make, I mean, he didn't do as much movement. You know, with Nick Cosgray, the, the head athletic trainer, he, he did a few workouts towards the end where he was moving with like resistance bands, but he, he wasn't moving as much because his injury progress seems a little bit more behind because his injury is more recent. But like, where do you kind of put that percentage if if you're just kind of speculating or guessing like for that right right tackle battle in training camp? I would I would kind of lean towards Jonah having, you know, a bit of a. um you know, a bit of an advantage. I'm not going to say it's like overwhelming. Um, you know, my guess would probably be something like 70, 30 that Jonah wins that job over Jackson. Um, I'm actually not going to give, um, you know, Lael Collins a chance to win that job right now, just because we haven't I right. mean, we're talking about a guy who is coming back from, from, you know, pretty significant surgery. Hasn't really done a ton. Like we haven't even seen him do kind of workouts off to the side. I, I think he's a pup candidate to start the year. Um, oh yeah. Obviously, we'll know more about that in five weeks. So, yeah, I mean, I th- I think Jonah's going to have the inside track. But again, you know, I I, I really want to emphasize this point. You know, I talked to Orlando Brown about this week about that this week. You know, transitioning from left to right is not, you know, a- as easy as people might think. It's you're basically inverting every one of your steps. Everything has to be flipped. Um, you know, for some people, it, it's easier to to play the left side or some people it's easier to play the right side. You know, Orlando Brown was talking about how he's left handed and you want to have your outside mm-hmm. hand as, uh, you know, when you strike, you want to make that your hardest punch. And, um, you know, it's just you, you kind of have to go through all of these little things, all these little mechanics. So, you know, I, I don't think it'll be as easy as some people think. You know, I think a lot of people are going to look at it and say, oh, well, you know, Jonah Williams moved from left tackle to right tackle. Right tackle is an easier position to play. And, um, you know, he was a starter last year, so he'll be a starter again. It, it, it's not that simple. Um, but I do think Jonah um, will kind of handle that pretty well. Um, you know, I think he'll kind of make his uh, make the best of it, and I think he'll be the starter at right tackle. Um, wouldn't be stunned. Uh, I think that that's fair with the 70-30 split. Wouldn't be stunned if Jackson Carmen wins that job, but I, uh, I lean Jonah right now. Yeah, same. I, I mean, I would be surprised just talent-wise and experience-wise. He has a, you know – well, I guess Collins has, has plenty of experiences too, but he's coming off the the a more significant injury. It's older, um, and and you know Jackson Carmen just I, I don't know hasn't shown enough to really um, you know give you confidence that he'd be able to leapfrog uh, a guy like Jonah Williams. I think Jonah's motivated. He was in very good physical shape despite the injury. So um, yeah, I, I would say he has the the you know distinct advantage um, to to win this um, starting job. I agree with you there. 65, 35, 70, 30. I lean towards that split. I want to ask you guys this question, though. It is probably a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I was talking with one member of the Bengals media beat who I won't name on here, but um, I was talking to him about this, and I thought he was crazy for posing this, but now that I think about it, maybe he kind of makes sense. You've got a lot of depth on that right side. Akiba Deneji, Lyle Collins, Jonah Williams, Jackson Carmen. Uh, Cody Ford, of course, who they signed on a one-year deal to compete. Do you entertain the idea of trading Jackson Carmen the same way you traded Billy Price two years ago? Or do you just not even think about that and say, thank God we have the best numbers we've had at right tackle in a long, long time? No, I, I've I've made this case, I think, on on here before. I actually don't trade any of them, um, you know, because I think, like I said, Le Collins is going to start on PUP. Um, obviously we'll see how the next five weeks of his recovery go. Maybe he'll be ready to go sooner in training camp or something like that. But, you know, assuming that he does, I mean, you're going to be in a situation where Orlando Brown is your left tackle. Let's say Jonah's your right tackle. Jackson Carmen's going to be a backup tackle that can do both. I mean, having Leo Collins around doesn't exactly hurt. Um, you know, so, I, I mean, I just think that, you know, when you, when you kind of look at, um, you know, some of the depth that you can have, both in terms of, you know, 
at the tackle position, but that also means that, you know, maybe you can send some of these guys like Hakeem Adenogy and say, you know, we need you to focus on being a guard only. And the, you know, the interior position would kind of ramp up there. I mean, injuries are going to happen along the offensive line. So, you know, it feels kind of important to say that, you know, hey, look, this is not going to be the unit that, um, you know, that kind of carries the Bengals throughout the years. Somebody's going to go down. But I just think if you keep these guys, and I think you should keep all of them, um, you know, cap cap questions uh, aside, um, you know, I think that you should keep all of them because, uh, you know, let's say you're in training camp and, you know, Jackson Carmen needs to miss a month for a shoulder injury, in, you know, or whatever injury here. Then all of a sudden you are Orlando Brown and Jonah Williams at your tackles. Lael's still out. Jackson Carmen's now out. And you are like one misstep away from being in the exact same position that you were last year, just when you thought you had the best depth and the best offensive line that you've had in, in Joe Burrow's career. So, yeah, I, I, I would keep all these guys. I mean, if somebody came in with a legitimate offer, I'd be willing to listen. But, I mean, they couldn't train Jonah. Um, you know, we don't know how serious things got. He thought that they had a couple offers or, you know, there was some interest. Um, I'm not sure what Jackson and Carmen would get them, um, you know, in terms of, of value. Um, you got depth. I think you got added depth with, you know, Cody Ford working there. Still have a team of energy, but... Um, I, I just don't know what kind of package or value Jackson Carmen gets you. Um, you know, if Jonah Williams were to lose the job, you know, maybe there'd be somebody that would be willing to part with something of, of value. But, um, you know, I'm not sure they would get anything in return. If like they weren't moved in the uh, spring by any trade offers for Williams or interest, I don't see it happening now, um, now that they're, you know, going into camp. Well, what, yeah, I so, think unless – Go ahead. So I was going to say, Mike, what, what would you consider to be like a legitimate offer? Because you kind of have to play that that weird game of, you know, whatever you trade them for, it's probably not going to be. I mean, obviously, like player for player trades happen, but it's probably going to be a pick. So like what what would you consider to be like a legitimate offer in that situation? For Jonah? No. Well, I guess for Jonah and for Jackson, like what what as what would GM Nizalik pull the trigger on for both of those guys? <laughs> <laughs> for Jackson Carmen, probably like anything. Um, but if you're not going to use them, but um, for Jonah, I don't know, a contingent pick, maybe based on playing time that can go up like a fifth rounder that can go up or something at this point, if you're not going to play them, cause you're going to probably lose them anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, yeah, make it, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, of, if he plays if, 90% of the snaps, it goes up to a fourth or something like that. Yeah, I think that that's a fair way to say. It. I was going to say if, if if you get a third, you're you're. I think it, it, if Jonah starts, you can't trade him. Like if he's going to win that right. starting job, you can't trade him. But um, and then his yeah, value goes if, down if he doesn't start. So I don't know if you'd be able to get a third or something. A hundred percent agreed. So yeah, yeah I uh, I think you're probably looking at like a fourth or a fifth. Yeah, I I like that. I think that makes sense because I mean. Or, or I don't know what a player to player one would look like. Like, obviously, Billy Price is what got the Bengals. BJ Hill. Um, I forget if there was any more draft capital involved in that deal, but it could be player to player. But I don't know who that would be because that right there is like a whole another can of worms. But that is very interesting. Um, I wouldn't say it's anything serious because, like Mike said, un- unless someone comes with a good offer, I don't think you really sit and think about it. But you got to put it in the back of your head because. This team did something similar two years ago with another lineman like Price, who I don't want to say was a bust, but wasn't what he was supposed to pan out to be. And now he's actually in New Orleans. He actually just got traded again earlier this week. So ironic that we're mentioning his name. Uh, But speaking of, you know, players who stood out in training camp, I think another one is Jordan Battle, who we talked about this week. And instead of talking about him, we're going to talk with him as he joins me for a one on one chat in the locker room talking about uh, his rookie outlook and what he plans on doing going into next season in training camp. We'll have that great conversation with Jordan Battle when we return right here on the Strictly Stripes podcast. This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Wherever your work takes you, you know it's going to be a good time because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free breakfast, fully equipped gyms, and free high-speed Wi-Fi. To help you take care of any last-minute business or help keep you in the know on all things sports. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay today at LQ.com. 
All right, three, two, one. And thanks for staying with us on the Strictly Stripes podcast. Joining me in the Bengals locker room is rookie safety out of Alabama, Jordan Battle. Jordan, uh, I don't think we've had an official, you know, one-on-one formal chat this off season. So appreciate your time. Uh, how, how have the first few weeks in Cincinnati been for you, my friend? Yeah, everything's been great. Um, just getting acclimated with everything, uh, getting acclimated to the city. Uh, so the football team, uh, meeting guys, you know, yeah. getting better, getting better on the field, whether it's you know technique, technique wise or, or communication, uh, just doing doing everything I need to do, you know, you know to to show these guys or to, to show the vet and everything um, that they can that can trust a young guy uh, back there with them. So um, yeah, it's been good it's getting acclimated, you know, learning new guys. Uh, you know, learning the responsibility of the safety in this defense, uh, learning the expectations of the defense of the team, uh, which is to win the Super Bowl. So uh, that's been that's been great for me. I know one thing you you talked about just a moment ago, and you talked about this when you you talked with us, like, I think last week, is communication, communication, communication. People might hear that and think, oh, it's cliche. Everyone communicates, but it's obviously not. Especially you know when you play with your role on defense, playing so far back downfield. Yeah. What what does Jordan Battle look like and sound like as a communicator? Yeah. Um, just whether it's hand signals or whether it's uh, being loud or, or extra loud, making sure every everybody has a call. Uh, that's that's what it takes. And when you when you give the call, make sure the guy you know echoes it back or he gives you a hand signal back uh, just to let you know that we're all on the same page. So uh, that's that's the biggest thing when it comes to communication. Just you know being on the same page because uh, when we all on the same page, it's, it's hard for teams to, to move the ball. A lot of that comes down to your own doing, your own work. But you also played for uh, one of the greatest coaches of all time in Nick Saban. Yeah, how much do you attribute that to what you did with Nick when you were at Alabama, as you know, with him as your head coach? Yeah, uh, obviously that's that's a, that helped me a lot uh, as a as a player, uh, as a leader, and as a, as a communicator as well. Um, you know, playing for Alabama, uh, it's high expectations, just like it is here. Uh, it's, it's you have to communicate because uh, you're going to play in loud games uh, in college football, of course. Uh, you're going to play in loud games in your stadium. You have you know in your stadium fits uh, one in 10,000 people in their, in their stadium and then you have a full pack house. Uh, communication the biggest thing and um, that's, that helped me a lot uh, coming from Alabama and um, I always, always look back at that and like thank God uh, I chose Alabama because uh, that put me in the position I am in today. How is it going from Nick Saban to Lou Anarumo? Very similar, very different. How do you describe that? Yeah, I, would say, I would say it's very, uh, very similar. You know, uh, I know I keep saying it, but just just based on expectations, you know, you have guys and you have guys that you you know you recruit, whether it's college or you draft, whether it's NFL. Um, you, you you base you base that off guys you trust, uh, guys you trust you can can run a defense, guys you trust can do the right things on the field, guys you, you can trust to do the right things off the field. So uh, that's that's been a big thing uh, with uh, Coach Lou, and uh, that's that's a big comparison. I, I definitely can see uh, Lou and. Coach Saban, you know, linking up and having a great talk if they ever got together. <laughs> Lou, Lou Saban, or I guess what would be Lou Saban, Nick Anarumo? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, maybe if he, if he needs another nickname other than Mad Scientist, which I know Eli Apple used to call him that. Maybe that, that's a good name for him. Uh, but, you know, you're right next to one of your fellow safeties, Dax Hill, mm-hmm. uh, who you'll be playing a lot with. Yeah. The, you know, no matter what the, the formation or setup is, you, you'll be doing a lot with him. Yeah. Um, you know, you guys are about the same age. You both came from blue blood programs, mm-hmm. Michigan, Alabama, very similar. Um, do you feel like you guys have a lot in common because of that? Like, what, what is that relationship like with the similarities you guys have? Yeah, um, I would say definitely coming from those those big time programs. Uh, you know, Harbaugh over at Michigan and uh, Coach Saban at uh, Alabama. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the expectations were the same there. Uh, I'm pretty sure um, the the pitch on, on defense. You know, defense was a a hot topic for both teams, you know. Yeah. Uh, I know we both we both were used uh, in the right ways in college, uh, versatility-wise, or whether it's being versatile, being you know being that aggressive sometimes, covering guys, or, or you know playing in the post. So uh, yeah, I definitely, I definitely say we have some similarities as uh, safeties, and definitely we are uh, same age. I would say I think we're the same age. Should be around the same age. Came out. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah, we came out high school the same time. Uh, he dropped a little early. Yeah. So. Yeah, he, yeah. He came three years. I stayed four years. So yeah, definitely the same age. Definitely have some similarities, and uh, definitely look forward to playing next to him as well. My last question for you, and, and I always like to wrap up every interview with this. I know you've only been here for a couple weeks, but I think you've been here long enough to, you know, explore some spots, do some things uh, around the Queen City. What does Jordan Battle already like to do in Cincinnati at this point? What do you like to do, man? Um, I've been around a couple. I've been a main event uh, 
Top Golf. Um, been to good some, choice. yeah, some restaurants. Went to Ruby's the other day. Uh, Another Jeff good Ruby's, yeah. Uh, went to been to the Eagle. Another uh, great choice. Yeah, See, you're, you're already you're three for three. Yeah, uh, the Philson. Uh, so, I, so I've been around a little bit. I, I walked walked the um, walked the river uh, a couple times. Speaking my language. Yeah. So okay. I've, I, yeah, I've been around. Just you know, exploring the city. Uh, walked the strip. You know, been to the Reds. Been to a Reds game. There you go. Uh, they're getting they, good. Yeah, they, I'm about to say they. Loose. Yeah, they're getting better. Uh, so probably yeah. Look forward to doing more more things around the city. Uh, whether you know whether it's giving back or whether it's having fun. So um, definitely definitely loving the city right now. Man, I gotta learn how to have fun like you, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you gotta have fun. You know, when you're having fun most of the time, your life is at peace, man. Amen, brother. Appreciate your time, Jordan. Never enough time with you, but I'm sure we'll be chatting again very soon, especially once we get to training camp. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. We'll be right back on the Strictly Stripes podcast. All right, thanks for staying with us on the Strictly Stripes podcast. Had a great chat with Jordan Battle, who you can definitely tell uh, was coached by Nick Saban. Uh, he is a Nick Saban prodigy. Uh, because he emphasizes communication, communication, uh, no lack of times mentioning the word communication when I chatted with him. But that's exactly why I think Luana Rumo and Zach Taylor love him. So we'll see how that plays out. Before we uh, wrap up our off-season workout chat here, we want to remind you guys to sign up for our Cincinnati Football Insider subtext service. I'm not going to talk about it, though, because you guys have already heard me talk about it. I'm going to let... You know, I, usually I assign this to either Mike or Andrew. I'm going to let either one of you guys, uh, you you pick between each other. Flip a coin, do whatever you want, rock, paper, scissors. One of you guys talk about. How would we flip a coin? Yeah, how would we flip a coin virtually? One, one of you guys hold a coin, hold a quarter, <laughs> and then you someone picks heads or tails. Whoever loses, wins, whatever. I don't know. Just being sarcastic. Either way, one of you guys uh, tell our listeners why they need to sign up for Cincinnati Football Insider, even though. We're in the off season. Why they still need to sign up? Well, it's a good way to connect with us directly. Um, like we said, we've we've talked about on this podcast. I mean, you get uh, updates. You can uh, chat with us. You can take part in, in conversations. Um, you know, anytime. Uh, just at the you know, it's a, up. You just have to text. Um, you, t- you just sign up. You text five one three nine four nine four one four seven to sign up. Um, or there's a link that's kind of um, locked on our page that you can click on. It's it's really easy to sign up, and it's also easy to cancel at any time if you need to. You just text STOP. Um, there is a two-week free trial, um, so that's exciting. So you can kind of get a feel for it and see if you like it. Um, but like we said, it's just an easy way to keep up with updates that we're doing um, directly from the practice field. Our training camp's a great spot. I mean, we'll be texting our observations uh, every day. Uh, they announce their open practices. And we'll be Each of us will be at every one of them and texting out uh, to our subscribers. So make sure to do it. Make sure you do it. Like he said, this is a great time to do it because once we go into training camp, we're only going to up the uh, texts, but we're going to get it going now with the off season. So be with us on this journey. It's been a lot of fun texting our subscribers and we want you to be a part of the Cincinnati Football Insider family. So we haven't really talked much about Joe Mixon in the last couple of weeks, really because he hasn't talked. He's not going to talk until training camp. You know, he made that clear, I believe, uh, sometime earlier this offseason, like a month ago. So we're going to hear from him in five weeks. But even though Zach Taylor uh, talked about how he is firm on keeping Mixon as a starter and we saw in practice how they ran a lot of plays designed with Mixon in mind, even in the 7-on-7s seven and 11-on-11s. Seven of course, uh, he's not completely out of the woods yet because, number one, uh, his legal case is still pending, so we don't know what's going to happen with that. And depending on the outcome of that, could the NFL issue a punishment? Definitely, depending on the outcome. But here's the other thing, too, though. Like, we talked about, you know, Saquon Barkley and, you know, Aaron Jones taking a pay cut with the Green Bay Packers. Dalvin Cook getting released, Josh Jacobs not signing his tender. I mean, I know there's been reports, or at least there were reports a while back since we last talked about him, that, you know, he's expected to take a pay cut this offseason. And, of course, these are just reports that are out there. But is Mixon completely in the clear? Like, is, is he walking in to training camp as the surefire starter? Or can there still be a left turn, whether it's the legal case, whether it's, you know, they ask him to take a pay cut and he says no, like, 
Is there still something that could come out with Mixon in the next couple of weeks going into training camp? This episode is brought to you by Zillow. You've probably spent hours Zillowing on Zillow, scrolling through beach houses, looking up the Zestimate of your boss's house. But Zillow is so much more than searching for homes. Now, Zillowing means finding a top agent, someone who can answer all your home buying questions, even the ones you're embarrassed to ask. They'll take you on tours, offer expert local advice, and help you get into the home of your dreams, whether it's on a beach or not. Zillow, let's get you home. Download the Zillow app today. It would surprise me if there was just because they've gotten to that point where, you know, they've, they've said repeatedly that they're moving forward with them. Um, or at least Zach Taylor has. I guess he could say it was above his pay grade to, to you know, say he was safe. But just based on the way they've talked, um, you know, I guess the running back, you know, if they were to sign one, wouldn't have missed much in terms of their offseason program. But, um, you know, Dalvin Cook is out there. So I suppose until he's off the market, I mean, you can't say that they couldn't find an upgrade, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the I mean, I, I think um, you know, it's it's in he's in the clear, I think, in terms of being on the roster, I would say. Um, you know, but I, I also think that, you know, you, you kinda just look at some of the free agents that are out there. Uh yeah, Dalvin Cook's out there. I think he would kind of represent an upgrade. Um and even if you don't think any of these guys represent an upgrade to their number one situation, I think that they would kind of represent an upgrade just to the room overall. Uh, Zeke Elliott's out there. I'm not saying that he's going to be, um, you know, a number one back, but if you can kind of work him and come hit or have him come in as a, um, you know, as like a backup running back, a guy who can, you know, pass block really well, who can split some of the carries. I think Zeke's an option. Um, we'll see on Fournette. Maybe Fournette could be an option just to bring these guys into camp, see what they can do. Um, you know, I know Kareem Hunt's getting listed by, uh, you know, a couple of different reporters as being, you know, or I guess the commanders are kicking tires on Kareem Hunt. James Robinson is now a free agent. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring in another running back. And, and frankly, I think they should. Um, you know, I think they should bring in another running back just to kind of, you know, make some kind of competition there at uh, at running back. But um, I, I, I don't think he's kind of out of the woods yet in terms of having a, a clear number one role. I think you could kind of have like a 1A, 1B situation. Um, you know, if you sign anybody and they, and they play really well or, you know, if Chase Brown plays really well. But, um, yeah, I think uh, I think it's pretty safe to assume at this point that he's going to be on the team. Yeah, I think so, too. Really, the, the only question is like the legal case, like what's going to happen? Um, and, you know, if he's found guilty of the aggravated menacing and of course, um, I don't know what's going on with the case right now. I think his last hearing was about a month ago, so obviously it's still pending, but say he's found guilty, maybe the NFL issues of punishment, I would say probably issues of punishment, whatever that would look like. I think that would be the only concern for Mixon at this point, you know, and then the Bengals just have to deal with that and see how that shuffles the depth chart. But yeah, I think with him, it really just comes down to that. Uh, And then with Joe Burrow, I know we have speculated and speculated and speculated uh, everything with, when is the deal going to get done? What is it going to look like? I'm not going to ask you guys about that because I think we've talked about it enough and there's really no point talking much more about it until the deal gets done. But since we, you know, when it comes to Joe Burrow, we like to do our little over under kind of game, which I think we did with like Jalen Hurts and their stats last week. What? So I set the over under of getting a deal done like date wise. I set it for July 15th. So do you say over under Burrow gets a deal done before or after July 15th? Uh, I'm going to say over. Um, I think that, um, so you know, past when, July 15th. Yeah. Um, you know, the, their first practice is July 26th. Um, you know, I mean, Josh Allen's contract didn't get signed until the first week of August. Um, so I mean, maybe they're going to take that kind of path and, uh, you know, it takes a little bit for it to get signed, um, for whatever reason. I mean, I think it's pretty, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna happen in the, in the next two months. You would, you would, I would almost bet anything on that. Um, You know, but, uh, you know, I just think that, you know, they're going to report, you know, Joe Burrow is going to report, you would assume at some point after the 15th, but, you know, before the 26th. So what would that be? You know, the 18th, 19th, 20th, kind of that week, Um, you know, maybe you're talking about a a press conference as I look at my calendar here. I mean, maybe you could do something the 24th or the 25th and have a nice little lead into camp. Uh, Maybe you could do something, um, 
on, you know, the, uh, like the 28th or the 29th, there's a back together weekend at Paycor stadium. Yep. Uh, so they're going to have a practice there with, you know, obviously way more fans. Um, so maybe that's the time to kind of have Joe Burrow come out in front of everyone and, you know, have this big deal about, Hey, look, now he's here and, and kind of make it a big deal. So there's a lot of different things that could happen. And I just think it's going to be after July 15th. Yeah, I agree. I think it'll be closer or, or, or after the start of training camp. So I, I don't think it'd just be in the middle of the month. Um, I think that's way too early. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it is, but I figured, okay, training camp starts like a week and a half after that. So do they tease it right before training camp? Is there a chance? Do they, do they even try to open up the month with like, oh, surprise, happy 4th of July, Joe Burrow's getting signed, which, again, I don't think is going to happen. But I set the over-under out of there to see if you guys had a take on that. But, yeah, I would just think, you know, along the lines of what you guys said, it's going to be done at or around training camp. Uh, the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes contracts, I think, are good guiding points for the historical trends. Um, and, honestly, I would even say that makes sense because – I think Justin Herbert's going to get a deal done before Burrow. Like, I don't know when that would be between now and then, but like two weeks from now, three weeks from now, I definitely could see Herbert uh, getting his deal done just because I think naturally Burrow's worth more and maybe he sees that. And and I don't know if that's part of the strategy. I'm speculating. Maybe they saw, okay, Jalen Hurts done, Lamar Jackson done, eventually Justin Herbert done. And then it's like, okay, save the best for last. Until, of course, Trevor Lawrence and whoever else you want to think of gets their deal done next year when they're eligible. But I'm with you guys on all of that. Now, I want to tell our listeners something really exciting that's going to kind of change the way we're doing the podcast uh, for at least the next five weeks until we get to training camp. So we've talked about the offseason. We've talked about workouts. But we are going to do something completely different, and that is we are going to rank our top 25 Bengals entering the 2023 season from number 25 all the way to number one. You guys probably know who number one is. No surprise there, but uh, we're going to rank every uh, top ranked player from 25 to one. We're going to have a podcast on each individual player. So number 25 will have their own pod, number 20, number 10, you know, the order, you know, the drill. Uh, And we might even hear from some of these players themselves on the podcast of the day that we talk about them. So no promises, no guarantees on that, but it could happen. There's always a chance. So uh, make sure you tune into that. We're going to have a lot of great debates that will carry us uh, through the off season. A lot of fun debates that will definitely get you fired up for training camp in the 2023 season. And, and guys, we, we already know the order, obviously like the us three know the order, but like how excited are you guys to like talk about this? Cause I actually, when I put, my rankings together, I put a lot of thought into it, and I would imagine you guys did the same too. Well, it's just, you know, it's it's hard to try and, you know, figure that out because it's, you know, I mean, how many times are you saying, you know, okay, who's who's better, who's more impactful to this team, a cornerback or a guard? And, um, you know, it's, or a it, kicker. it's a unique list, and I think people will, <laughs> uh, I think people will enjoy it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I am looking forward to it. So make sure you tune in. We're going to start Monday. We're going to start these podcasts on Monday. And like I said, we're going to do it for the next five weeks to get through training camp. And of course, we'll still have some segments on Joe Burrow. Uh, and if anything else that's interesting pops up, we'll, we'll talk about it. So, you know, th- this is why this is fun. This is flexible. We, we set the agenda. We are the Strictly Stripes podcast. That is how we roll. And we hope you roll along with us. Well, enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Once again, for myself, Mike, and Andrew, I'm Muhammad Ahmad. See you next week.